This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We've got another day, another opportunity to serve God and to study his word. And so I say welcome to Hardin County campus, Indiana campus, Louisville campus, E campus, and to all of our visitors and listeners and online students who tune in every week. Let me just say Happy Mother's Day to you all because we are now in the season and this is Mother's Day time. So don't forget mom. Some of us do not have a mom. So let me say it's a club that you do not want to belong to, but if you keep on living, you're going to belong to it. So cherish your mother now while you can. In fact, our series We'll talk about the power of a praying mother. Uh, you know, I, the old song I'm thinking about, uh, somebody pray for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. I'm so glad they did. And one of the persons that prayed for me, had me on their mind, was my mother, who's gone to be with the Lord now, but I, I, I tell you, the lessons that she taught us, me and my sister, uh, my uh, a niece, my nephew, and great, they still live with us today. So welcome. Our lesson today is, I know what prayer can do. And through this lesson, what we want you to get is despite what people think about us, say about us, God has the last word in our lives. And after he has blessed us, what should we do? We should lift him up in prayer and praise. So the opening, let me set the uh, uh, background for you. The opening chapter of the book of Samuel, Samuel 1, chapter 1, closes the era of the judges. And it prepares us for the rule of the kings. You know, the people have been saying, we want a king, we want a king. So, but during this time, society had become a cesspool, a pit of depravity and corruption. So when that's when Samuel was born. It kind of sounded like he was born in today. During his day, his day was a time when people slipped into immoral, lawless, abusive, violent, compromising, and permissive lifestyle. The depth of their moral decay, hear me now, was seen in cases such as gang rape, homosexuality, Wife abuse, child abuse, drug abuse, murder, kidnapping, widespread pornography, greed, injustice, idolatry, and civil war. You see, the era of the judges was the darkest period in Israel's history. Days that witnessed the utter, the complete, spiritual and moral collapse of the people. And as a result, the basic institutions of the nation collapsed. What am I mean? The home collapsed. Society collapsed. Religion collapsed. And then the government. And notice the order. It started with the home. And the home impacts the community, which impacts society, which impacts the church, and the church impacts the government. Such a dark period of history called for great leaders, but there were no great leaders to be found. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes as he saw fit. No one, no one obeyed 
God. Their lives demonstrated the light of God. Their, their lives demonstrated the light of God's holy word, and that light had gone out. It's amazing how it feels that we are living during the same time. But God is always going to have a remnant of people. I don't care what it looks like today. God's got some people who will live right for him. They love the Lord and they will obey the Lord and will keep his commandments. And we're going to talk about such a person today. And this person, it's Mother's Day, so you should know, it's Samuel's mother, Hannah. Now, I got some other things I need to let you know to set the stage. Many times, you know, we go into certain stores and they will have a special selection of items that are considered to be damaged goods. Now, these items have either been dented, scratched, or something is wrong with them. And they are said to have no value. They are supposed to uh, be more problem than it's worth. Now, because these items are considered damaged, they are either marked down to a very reasonable price or in some stores would just throw them out. Why? Because they are considered trash. To the store, they have no profitability. To them, they are damaged goods. And how many people in society today who feel that they are damaged goods? Well, in this story, we're going to talk, and women, let me just put it this way. I'm not going to say this woman. But in the history of the text time that we're looking at, women were considered useless if they couldn't have children. Now, our lesson is about Hannah, and Hannah was barren and therefore had no children. Hannah longed for children. And unlike many in today's society, because, you know, many women today don't want children for whatever reason, whether it's they don't they their lifestyle or they won't don't want the problem or whatever it may be, but women in biblical times wanted children. I sat here amazed over the fact that a young child, what in today I'm talking about today, I'm not talking about the lesson now. I'm talking about this five year old child that was put in a suitcase found right here in the Kentucky, Indiana area. And nobody stepped up and claimed the child. Somebody should have missed him long time ago. Somebody thought he was damaged goods. And so they threw him out in the trash. Who? It, it, it's mind boggling. This is the time. I'm not talking about Bible time. I'm talking about today time. Someone saw this child as damaged goods, had no value, had no use. But let me tell you that that's not the way the women in biblical times felt. They wanted a child. They wanted a family.
let me <laughs> put something else on your mind. Not only did women in the Old Testament desire children, but they looked upon having children as an approval from God that they were without sin. And so when a woman was unable to have children, she was not socially accepted by those who could. She was publicly criticized, talked about, harassed, teased, provoked, made to feel less than a woman and was considered to be worthless and useless. Now just let me stop here again because here's one who sits before you who does not have a biological child. This is why I said at the top, every woman who has given birth to children are not necessarily a mother. And there are some who had never given birth who are more mother than some who have given birth. And I fall in that category. I have not had a biological child. Ah, oh, but I like to think that I have birthed a lot of children. I have birthed teachers, preachers, believers. I have given birth just by the word of God. So if left to society, I would be damaged goods. But I thank God because we just got through studying about celebrate because Jesus is alive. I thank God that he looked beyond my fault and saw my need. But in biblical times, when a woman couldn't have, even her husband could turn against her. What I mean by that? He could kill her because she brought this honor to him, reproach upon him. In fact, this is one of the reasons God permitted divorce. So instead of killing her, a man could send his wife back to her father. But guess what? she will live the rest of her life as a widowed woman because she was now considered damaged good. She was worthless and useless to any man. But let us look at this woman in our lesson today. First Samuel chapter 1. Verses 1 through 5. There was a certain man from Raphael Thamos, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkina, son of Jehoram, the son of Elahu, the son of Tuhu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other, Paniah. Now, Paniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hopni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give a portions of the meat to his wife, Paniah, and he would give and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Why? Because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Let's look first at Hannah's sanctity. Hannah's name means gracious, our graciousness, our favor. 
and Hannah was the favorite wife of Elkanah. And although a godly man, he followed the common custom of polygamy in those days when every man did what was right in his own eyesight. As it was the burning desire of every Hebrew parent to have a son, Hannah was barren. And she may have urged her husband to take another wife so that Elkanah's name might be perpetuated. Now, the second wife, Paniah, of whom we know nothing, save that she bore Elkanah several children and she grieved Hannah. But Hannah is a beautiful example of how the most unpleasant and most unexpected circumstances can produce a child who can in turn bless the world. Now, because of her godliness, her devotion, her trust, her patience, her self-sacrifice, she came to be signatively blessed of the Lord and in turn communicated to her renowned son, Samuel, the faithfulness and trustworthiness of God. And as parents, particularly godly parents, we need to instill that in our children. Now, let me say this. Let's get into a little deeper study here because I want to point something out to you. The family into which Samuel was born, Samuel was born into a bigamous family with parents who conformed to the carnal society or uh, sort of uh, carnal social order and culture of their day. Now, the father, Elkanah, was a priest. But the thing that troubles me is that as I looked and read, I saw no apparent religious functions that he carried out. Then you have the two wives of Elkanah. And Elkanah, see, here it is. Elkanah was a bigamist, marrying two wives. Okay, suppose Hannah did say you should get another wife. He's a priest. And by taking two wives, he conformed to the culture the carnal, flashy society of his day. And in fact, the fact that a priest committed bigamy, bigamy shows just how carnal, flashy, and lawless God's people had become during Samuel's day. Okay, it was common practice for a man to take a second wife when his first wife could not have children. But apparently, Elkanah, Elkanah, I don't know why I keep calling his name wrong, Elkanah lacked faith in the Lord, fell to trust him to give Hannah a child. Now, and let me just say this. Polygamy or bigamy is transgression of God's explicit will. Marrying two or more people violated God's holy word. It violated God's original institution for marriage. God's will is clearly stated. Man and woman are to leave their parents and become 
united in marriage and become one flesh. God clearly, God's clearly stated purpose is monogamy, one husband, one wife. But we don't see that in the family of Samuel. So while we can say Hannah was damaged goods, if we want to look at it, we could say the whole family was damaged goods. But the good thing is God didn't throw, as he did, you can go over to um, I, uh, 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 Jeremiah, and he go and said, go to the potter's house. And he went and he saw the potter on the potter wheel. And the vessel became marred. But the good news was he broke it down and started all over again. What I want you to see, he did not throw away the clay. And so I think that's why songwriters in yesteryear wrote such a song that said, Have thy own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it and steal. So God did not throw away the damaged goods, but he revitalized, he replenished, he refurbished, he refined and he used everybody. So now let's go back to the scripture, starting at verse 6 down to verse 9. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Have you ever seen people like that? Yeah. This went on not day after day, year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkina, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying. I told you the power of a praying mother prayed before the child even got there. Verse 12, she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were, were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and Grief. So now let's look at Hannah's sorrow. Hannah lived a life of miss. She was a misfit, damaged good. Not only was she a misfit, but she was miserable. See, while Hannah had a house, she did not have a home. 
and the idea of every Jewish woman was to be head of the home. But she had no children, no family. Oh, she had a devout husband. He loved her and gave her richer gifts than he did his other wife. But she was childless. Hannah suffered from this barrenness. She was socially unaccepted, criticized, not only from those in the neighborhood, but those in her family unit. Because the other wife, Panaya, would constantly harass, tease Hannah. So Hannah was disappointed, discouraged, had low self-esteem, felt useless, worthless, incomplete, forsaken. She considered herself as damaged goods in the eyes of others. And in her own mind, if that wasn't enough, she had to endure al misconception. He did not understand why Hannah was so unhappy. He should have, but he couldn't understand it. He loved her, and so he tried to fill the cracks of her broken spirit with a double portion, a worthy portion. And let me stop here and say many times, that's what we tried to do. We tried to replace what is bothering us with the temporary fix. And even though he treated her with respect, it was temporary. She was still considered in her mind and others as well as being damaged good. And then we have to have Panaya. Hannah had to put up with her meanness. She frequently haunted or taunted Hannah for being childish. Now notice, the green-eyed monster of jealousy was pregnant in Panaya who had children by Alcana, but not Hannah. The green-eyed monster wasn't present in Hannah, and she was childish. You would think Hannah would look at, at her side eye because she had children and Hannah didn't. But no, the one, the wife who had children was jealous of the wife who did not have children and taunted her. And as we read year after year, I'm not talking about day after day, but year after year, and the fact that El Kaina loved Hannah and bestowed a double portion upon her probably only added to the fuel of Panaya's contempt. And then look, that, I, she had a husband that didn't understand, another wife who, who acted a fool. Now she comes to the church and Eli the priest, he misunderstood her because he saw Hannah's lips moving in silent prayer. Eli the high priest misunderstood and condemned her. Now, this is the thing that always gets me, is Eli was sitting on the chair by the doorpost of the temple when she rushed in, so he saw her lips move silently, and he wrongly concluded that she was drunk. So he protested her behavior in the temple and strongly rebuked her. But the thing that we've got to, that I don't want us to miss, 
Hannah was praying to God. Eli did not have to hear. If he heard, he couldn't do anything about it. She was praying to the one who could do something about her problem. But in honor and respect and give him a little lead way, in this corrupt time period that they're living in, it might have been a common thing for the religious festival to become a drunken party because every man did what was right in his own eyesight. So when Hannah came in and started moving the lips and he couldn't hear anything, he just simply assumed that she was drunk. Then now let's look at what the next section tells us. 10 and 11, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me. Didn't we just hear that in the lesson? The thief on the cross said, remember me. And now here she's saying, your servant's misery, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. She's explicit. She's not just, she didn't say give me a child. She said, give me a son. Here's my vow, if you give me a son, I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. Now let's jump down to verse 17. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and she ate something and her face was no longer downcast. She prayed and she got an answer. She believed God. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remember her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So now let's look at Hannah's supplication. Hannah may, and this is what we need to get into our spirits. Hannah may have been childless, but she was not prayerless. And regardless of what we lack or we don't have, we do not have to be prayerless. We can still pray we can still go to the throne of God and ask him for whatever we want, praying according to his will. But Hannah, see, and even though she was childish, she was not prayerless, she still believed. And her pain found a refuge, a hiding place in prayer. And you got to catch this, catch this, catch this. She was not asking nor believing for a small thing. She didn't say, will you please shut this woman's mouth? For nine, please shut her mouth. I'm tired of her teasing, harassing me. This has been going on for years, Lord. She was not interested in that. 
I do not know whether the children respect or disrespect her. Hannah did not say anything about that. She was not asking nor believing for a small blessing. She was asking God, because only God can do this, to lift her into the empire of motherhood. She was barren. She couldn't have children. But she was asking God to interfere with the law of nature on her behalf. Woo! Lord, you got to catch that. She was asking God to interfere with the law of nature on her behalf. In other words, she was saying, do it for me. I, I'm not praying. This is me who stands in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so what we see with this, look at Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. She didn't say, but Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. But she just believed because she was asking God to interfere with the law of nature on her behalf. Look at Luke 1 and 37. Nothing will be impossible with God. So she, what's impossible to man is possible for God. Look at Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Look at Psalms 55, 16 to 17. But I will call on God, and the Lord will rescue me. Morning, noon, and night, I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. So, look again. Her prayer was, a supplication without external speech. Her prayer was internal. And as she spoke to herself, she created the impression that she was drunk with wine. But while she never said a prayer, she breathed a wish in her soul and sent it unspoken right to the throne of God. Look what Paul tells us, 826. Romans 826. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit, and notice this is a capital S, the Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. So let me just stop here and say this is what I want you to understand. There come a time where we get ready to pray and all we could just say, oh, Lord. And then trouble, burden, distress, we don't know, we just groan, we cry, we weep. But the Spirit catches our tears, our groans, our moans, and takes them to the throne of God and say, here's what Geneva is moaning about. Here's what this one is crying about. And God listens. Thank God for the Spirit. So we learn from Hannah that without question, through prayer, profound prayer, not saying a prayer, but somebody mistaken 
you praying for being drunk? She was praying. I told you at the top of this that somebody prayed for me. I had a mother that prayed for me because this is the power of a praying mother. And I've said it before. When I came home one day and told her that I just left the doctor's office and he wanted me to go immediately to the hospital, but I came home because I didn't want my mama to hear it from me calling from the hospital saying, I'm in the hospital. Mm -mm. But I went home and she said, now here's what I want you to do. You go to bed. Lay down. I'll get things ready for you. I'll pack your stuff so you can go to the hospital in the morning. But before she could do that, she went to her prayer closet. And I could hear her beseeching, begging, pleading with God. All over the house you could hear her. You can't beat the power of a praying mother. And so we have this with Hannah. And when you pray like that, circumstances can be changed. When you give a profound Sincere prayer, closed doors can be open. You know why I know? Because he can close a door that no man can open, and he can, he can open a door that no man can shut. And when you pray like that, we learn from Hannah that without question through prayer, profound prayer, unsolvable problems can be solved. So there is no unsolvable problem when it comes to God. And obstacles can be overcome. Thank God for that. But here's something I want you to notice. I'm going to throw this in for free. Deeper study number three. We see that Hannah... We see in verse 3 and again in verse 11, we see the word Lord Almighty is being used. Or we see Lord of hosts. And I let me say this term stresses God's sovereignty, his rule, and his supremacy, his ultimate leadership of Israel's armies and his supreme control over all the armies and hosts of the universe, both in heaven and on earth. So this is the first time Lord Almighty, our, the Lord of hosts, is found in scripture. And let me say, Lord Almighty is the name of royalty. The name that refers to God as the supreme ruler over all the beings and powers of the universe. He is the sovereign God over the entire universe. The Lord's supremacy over the people and the powers of this earth was a message desperately needed. The Israelites, as well as us, they were weak. We are weak. Their enemy was strong. Our enemy is strong. And the enemy was constantly attacking, brutalizing, oppressing, and enslaving them during the days of the judges. Their only hope was the intervention of God in their behalf, a mighty act of deliverance by God, and that we see him doing. So, Lord Almighty is also a military term. And it's used over 260 times in Scripture. 
so you could just see. Just picture the prophets ministering to God's people during the days of their terrible suffering, their enslavement and captivity. And when they prayed and cried out to God, they did not often address him simply as Lord as we do. But they said, or oh, you know, many times we say Father, but they say, O oh Lord of hosts, you who are Lord Almighty, the supreme ruler of the universe, the Lord in control of all the armies on earth and heaven. I've said it before and I say it again. We have got to study the names of God because the phrase Lord of hosts our Lord Almighty is used by Isaiah 62 times, Jeremiah 79 times, Zechariah 53 times and Malachi 24 times. And there are times that perhaps we need to be praying to Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts because that's who she need to pray to exactly because she was asking him to intervene with nature and only he can do it. Well, let's look at the lessons that we can learn from the story of Hannah. When we see Samuel and his contribution to the kingdom of God, we realize the importance that godly parents can make in the character of their children. See, you, we not going to call them stupid and, boy, you don't have a lick of sense and you just like your dad and all that kind of stuff. Godly parents can instill God in the character of their children. From Peniah, harsh treatment of Hannah, we discover how a thoughtless, unloving word can give sorrow to others. How, how necessary it is for us to guard our tongue. James 3, 9 and to 10 says, with the tongue we praise our Lord the Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And it should not be. Let's go. From Hannah's conduct under provocation, we first of all learn that the heart of God is a comforting retreat for a sorrowful soul. We learn that Hannah carried her trial and yearning to God in prayer. See, we want to complain. We do complain. Then we nurture that complaint. We rehearse and rehash it over again. But Hannah carried her trial and yearning to God in prayer and she teaches us something about the necessity for form and the spirit of intercession for the mouth now here it is we got to understand she shows us the necessity for form and the spirit that we need for intercession for the mouth to speak rightly. The meditation of the heart must be right. Let me say that again. For the mouth to speak rightly, the meditation of the heart must be right. 
Now compare Hannah's silent, heartfelt prayer with Psalms 19, verse 14. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So it's not only God, not, not only hears what's coming out of the mouth, but he sees what's in the heart. And many times he's probably asking, what is that in your heart? You still got bitterness. You still got anger. Do you think that God perhaps would have heard uh, Hannah's prayer if she had been praying to kill Paniah? But Paniah didn't even come up in her prayer. This was between her and God. And God, only you can do what I'm asking you to do. So, from uh, 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 Eli, who misjudged Hannah, we learn not to be too hasty in our conclusion. Too often we wrong others by misinterpreting their motives. You're not God, so stop trying to figure out people's motives and why they did what they did. And so God blessed Hannah with a son. She named him Samuel. And in she did not forget. She went right back and praised him. Second Samuel 2, 1 through 11. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. Y'all been talking about me, laughing at me, looking down on me. I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice. Why, Hannah? Because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Stop acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows what you have done. He will judge your actions. The bow of the mighty is now broken, and those who stumbled are now strong. So the strong has become weak, and the weak has become strong. Those who were well fed are now starving, and those who were starving are now full. And let me say today, those who feel like they got it all, enjoy it while you can, because the Ferris wheel will move again. And the one thing that I learned about, even as a child, going to the carnivals, is the Ferris, the Ferris wheel stops. Some are on the bottom, some are on the top. Some on the way to the bottom, some on their way to the top. So don't get excited if you're on the top. Because when the wheel moves, you will be one of those ones who's on the way down. And so Hannah lets us know those who were well fed are now starving, and those who were starving are now full. The childless woman now have seven children. See, God just didn't bless her with Samuel. He just kept on blessing her. He can pour you out a blessing that you can't hardly receive. And the woman with many children wastes away. The Lord gives both death and life. 
He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. He lifts the poor. The Lord makes some poor and others rich, but he brings down and lifts others up. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. See, he's recycling those who were considered damaged good. He sets them among prince, placing them in seats of honor. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones. That's shouting territory right there. But the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives power to his king, and he increases the strength of his anointed one. That's Hannah's pray, prayer of praise. And as we get ready to sign off, I just have this one question for you. What is your song of praise to the Lord after he has delivered you from your trouble? Can I tell you what mine is? Mine is a song by Hezekiah Walker. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God because he did it. Thank you. I'll see you next week. We will talk about it is well. It is well. We'll be going to 2 Kings chapter 4, starting at verse 8 through 38. Have a great Mother's Day.